because you guys were all on time. Okay, so let me ask you another really important question before I introduce what we're going to today, do today. I, this is my next question. Are you a, is it coming up yet? Are you a rock or a feather? Are you a rock or a feather? Can everyone type, are you a rock or a feather? And then I'll tell you what I am before I introduce myself. Are you a rock or a feather? Interesting. Okay, Alex is a feather. Ooh, Simon's a rock, okay. Paul Grange is a feathered rock. Masayu in, in, in Kuala Lumpur is a rock. Interesting. Ishan is a rock. I wonder if this is like all the men think that they're really like a rock. That's interesting. Sometimes a rock. I wonder if people who are rocks are stubborn and tough. So you see, with asking this very simple question, it's kind of the basis of what we're doing today. It makes you have to think about what is a rock, what is a feather, what are the attributes of that, how can we connect to that, what, and, and it's, it's forcing you to think creatively about that. I've done this before with another session, but sort of the idea of what we're going to be doing today. For me, I am a definitely not a rock, I'm a feather. I, I, a feather can be beneficial because I'm quite flexible and I'm willing to, willing to change with the wind, but sometimes I'm not, I'm not as strong enough as I should be, so I am a feather. Okay, just to introduce my, yeah, in teaching, you have to be a feather sometimes, right? I totally agree, Tamara. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, is there any, oh, I'll just do it very quickly because I think um, to speed up the beginning of this. So for just so the people who don't know me, because I'll quickly from that. So what are we doing today? Today, I always, the people who have come to my webinars before know I always start with a story. So we're going to have a story. We're going to look at some definitions and benefits of creativity. We're going to look at some ideas and theories, which are different than definitions. Um, and then we're going to finish up with lots and lots of different activities. Okay. Um, and I expect the more you guys type and get involved, the more fun it will be. I'll be asking questions throughout. And hopefully you can leave today with some new ideas, thinking about creativity in the classroom. Probably no ideas you've never had before, but I'm just trying to get them all in one place. Um, and as you know, for most of my webinars, the idea is to change the way we're thinking, well, to challenge the way we're thinking about things so we try new ideas in our classrooms. So this is the first story that isn't just about me, which is strange for my webinars. So when I first started, I started teaching back in 2004 and I thought I was a great teacher and I was super, um, you know, I, was, I had all these cool innovative ideas. And um, it was interesting because there was one, I, I ended up watching one talk that really changed the way I did my teaching. So in those first two years of teaching, it was kind of getting through, but I thought I was doing well. And... In 2006, I saw this gentleman. Who can tell me who this gentleman is? A very famous speech, if anyone can tell me. Does anyone know? I'm guessing Paul Granger will know. Or I'm guessing Simon Hallett might know. <laughs> okay, this is a very famous guy called Ken Robinson. And in two, back in 2006, he, he did a speech at TED. I think most people know TED, T-E-D. And I watched this speech on just when YouTube came out before it was blocked. <laughs> and after watching his speech, I really changed the way I thought about creativity in the classroom. And I realized how much I was doing in the classroom that was stopping creativity rather than encouraging creativity. And I think that the, the most important thing that Ken Robinson said in that video was, coming up now, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. And this, hi Mustafa, 
good to meet you today. Um, this idea has stayed true with me till now, and it, it changed the way I thought about doing my own job, but also really changed the way I think about teaching. And it really resonates with students. If students aren't prepared to be wrong, they're not going to come up with new ideas. And then in language learning, they're not going to come up with new ways to say things. So that video, I'm sure most, I mean, I'm sure, oh, hi from Mongolia. Uluk Bek, Matanov, I hope I said that correctly. I think you're our first person from Mongolia. That's awesome. Good to meet you. That video was, um, if, when I think about it now, it's fascinating. That video is 13 years or 14 years old now. It's had 18 million views. I highly recommend everybody goes back and watches it. I won't get into that video. The point of the story was that after seeing that 13 years ago, it changed the way I thought about creativity in the classroom and made me think every lesson is a chance to develop creativity in my students. So what is creativity? <laughs> I'm not going to give you a definition now. I'm not going to give you a definition. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to give you a definition. I don't expect you to type one. Creativity, before I do this thing on what is creativity, let's just do one more creative creativity activity. There are four animals on the screen. Four animals on the screen. Which is the odd one out? Which is the odd one out? You can type, which is the odd one out? Hmm, frog. I wonder why. Why do you say the frog? I wonder what Sarah says. Let's hear what Sarah Young has to say. Uh, okay, lots of people saying the same thing. Okay, because it's an amphibian, maybe. Any other answers? Anyone else have a different answer than the frog? Okay, Rhino, why? Alex, that's a very cool. Simon says the frog as well. Now, clearly, okay, let's see what everyone has to say. Amanda Jung, what are you going to say, Alex Lee? I'm interested to know. Okay, the lion, why? Paul, tell us why. Why Why? Why is one the odd one out? So I think that the, the just saying the frog is an amphibian is quite an... Facing a different direction. Ooh, that was a good one. Yeah, it could be that the lion is facing a different direction. Everyone else is saying the frog. That's interesting. So I think that what kids do, when you, when you do this activity with kids, they won't say the frog is an amphibian. Probably when they're six, they don't know that. They might say the frog is green. They might say the monkey, you know, the monkey eats bananas. The other ones don't. Yeah, most watched TED talk of all time, exactly. They might say the lion is it because it's a feline, you know, it's a type of cat. They might say that the, the rhino has a horn. My point of asking this question is it doesn't need, yes, Alex, good good point, right? <laughs> the, the point of asking this question is it's encouraging kids to think creatively. Hi, Fazan, ooh, Fazana, Fazane, Kashef, good to meet you. Um, the point of doing that activity is adults will go through the most logical answer. It's the amphibian. But the kids will never do that. The kids will come up with all these other cool answers, right? It might be it's a rhino because I think you can ride a rhino. So by putting these questions at children, even the youngest ones, that's one step into really thinking about how you can develop their creativity. But let's go and answer the question that I asked before. What is creativity? So. Let's look at the definitions. Um, what's so fat? Oh, hi, Nadja. It's good to see you. Such a good, good uh, webinar attendee that comes every week. So with the definitions of creativity, it's quite interesting because, yeah, we have a lot from Iran today. Maybe some of your friends that you introduced. So with a definition of creativity, it's quite a difficult one. I think we all know what creativity means inside, but as you'll see, there isn't one definition for creativity, and it's a hugely abstract concept. So this idea that creativity is just one thing is not very, not, not a good way to look at it. So let's look at some definitions on the next page. 
lots of definitions here, right? I, I don't, you don't need to read them. Actually, let's just have, let's just take 30 seconds and have a think, which definition do you like? Just scan it very quickly. You don't need to read every word. You'll notice that there are different definitions from different places. So if you like number one, number two, number three, sorry, number four or number five, the five, Okay, you like number three because it was the easiest one to read, right? <laughs> okay, I think a lot of people will say three because it's the fastest to read, right? Okay, so what my point of this was, oh, okay, number two, the ability to produce original and unusual ideas, right, or to make something new. What you'll notice with these definitions, guys, is that they come from different places, right? So in dictionary.com, it's quite long and... Um, and then if you notice, Merriam-Webster comes from the Webster Dictionary, which is a U.S. dictionary. Nice, short definition, very American way to define things. Number two is Cambridge, and it's quite similar to the Oxford one. So the Oxford definition is it's to use a skill and imagination to produce something. Cambridge has the ability to produce something original. And Wikipedia it comes from the people, so it's a little bit longer and has a broader definition. But... I want to get rid of all those definitions for today because I think that they're too dry, right? That's not what we think about when we're encouraging creativity. We don't think about these long definitions. I want to talk about this idea. Um, and this is what my favorite idea when it comes to creativity. And I um, just something to think about. Has anyone heard of big C and little c creativity? Big C creativity and little c creativity. Well, if you haven't heard of it, let's have a look. So people often talk about this in psychology and education. Big C creativity, well, I'll explain. So people talk about this idea of little c, middle c, and big C, but really they talk about little c and big C. So big C creativity is the true innovation, completely unique ideas that revolutionize the world, right? Th these are huge, big ideas and big, and big artworks and big songs and things that come out. Middle C might be, oh, Najis, you can't hear me? Can anyone else not hear me? You can still hear me, right? Yes. I think so because you wouldn't be typing great. Oh, well, sorry, Nudges. Uh, might be connection. Sorry, great. So middle C is this idea of in, it's bringing new ideas together and imagining new things. But what I'm most interested in today is this idea of little C. So little C is... Little C creativity are the hundreds, or oh, it's slowing down, hundreds of choices that you make each day to go through the world, all these little creative choices that you make. And that's what I'm most interested in to talk about today. We, we can inspire our students with big C things. Big C things are things like, you know, the great movies of the world. Um, oh, sorry, Nudges. Um uh, things like Shakespeare and the great writers. Shakespeare is obviously a big C creative. He changed the way that we think about writing. Um, you know, paintings like the Mona Lisa, which changed the way art was done. Songs like Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, huge buildings, you know, architects are super creative. They, they thought about how can they build these mega buildings like the, um, I can't remember what this one is called, but the one in uh, Dubai and this big one here in Shanghai, completely changing the way people thought about buildings. The Apple Mac and uh, Steve Jobs, seen as one of the most creative people that ever lived, but that's all big C creativity. And that's not something that we can ever expect our students to be doing in our classrooms, right? So let's really have a look a little bit deeper at this idea of little C creativity. This kind of creativity involves children predicting, guessing, hypothesizing, and risk-taking. All these words which are related to language learning, predicting, guessing, and hypothesizing and risk-taking are all essential skills to language learning, but also a part of creativity.
It's also things like non-verbal skills, right? Using gestures and mimes, which are all part of communication. This definition comes from Carol Reed. Carol Reed is an author uh, who writes for Macmillan Publishing. Um, another definition here, which I really, or another idea around creativity is the idea that linguistic creativity in particular is so much part of learning and using language that we tend to take it for granted. Yet from the ability to formulate new utterances, so little things, to the way a child, child tells a story, to the skill of stand-up comedy, or the genius of Shakespeare, linguistic creativity is at work. So Alan Maley is another linguist and, and language uh, teaching theorist, uh, based in Bangkok actually, but years and years of experience, and he says, you know, ling language and creativity are, are linked, and that's his idea. So do our students need to be creative at all? Why, why do they need to be creative? Well, let's have a quick look. I'm not going to read all of these, but there are so many reasons, and I'll, I'm going to send this out after, but there are so many reasons why encouraging creativity is useful for language learning and useful for your learners. The ones I like most here are number three, creative, creativity promotes problem solving. Problem solving is a huge advantage when you're learning a language. Creativity allows you to enter your happy zone. So once you're allowed to be creative, you can become more yourself and then you have more ownership over it. Um, creativity promotes risk taking. We need to take a risk. If we're too afraid to be wrong, we'll never be able to communicate. So many people learn languages uh, for 15 years and then they go out in public and they're too embarrassed to speak and then they never learn the language. And creativity encourages lifelong learning. But you can have a look at the rest of these later. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, but in and I have done this so many times in my sessions uh, over the years, but in 2015, the World Economic Forum came out with the top skills that people will need to get into the workplace um, in the future. And in 2015, they said the skills will be things like problem solving, critical thinking, and down here was creativity. But what they said was, Back then, they said in 2020, which is right now, <laughs> these are the skills that students will, uh, that that people will need. And creativity has moved right up here to the top with problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. That to survive now in your workplace, you you, you can't not have creativity. It just you it it is just an essential part of having to deal with things. We I mean, look at the current weeks that we've been living in with the uh, school closures due to this virus. We're having to be super creative and changing how we teach. We're doing online teaching, thinking about new ideas because all the schools are closed. If we were not creative, we wouldn't be thinking about how to do that. We'd just be sort of stuck, right? So the more creative, the better the outcome will be. Just one more point to make here on, on uh, this idea of you know future skills. People often talk about, um, 21st century skills and the four C's and having communication, uh, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. I, I don't think these are 21st century skills. These are just skills that stu uh, people have needed forever. But I just want to make the point is that all the schools around the world now um, in inter you know, IB schools and uh, many government schools focus on these four C's and one of them is creativity. And you can't really have creativity and not have critical thinking. They work very closely together. So that's just, just a point to make, is that creativity and critical thinking go hand in hand. So I'm gonna give you now really uh, my favorite sort of idea and theory around this um, and around integrating creativity into our classrooms. And this comes from Carol Reed. I will share this um, with you after the session and send it to you. It's a, ni it's a really nice article. I've always really liked the way she thinks about creativity. And she talks about the seven pillars of creativity. We're going to look at them and then later I'll show you how they integrate into, um, they integrate into some games and get you guys more active again. <laughs> So the first pillar, or oh, has anyone ever seen these before? Uh, Alex, Paul, anyone who can hear me? 
I'm not sure everyone can hear me anymore. Amanda, I think Amanda would have seen these before. Yeah. Okay. So if you have seen them, I'll just I'll go through them quite quickly, and then we'll relate back to them when we're looking at the activities. Okay. So the first one is, you know, it's obvious that we need to build up positive self-esteem of our students. Unhappy students sitting in rows, you know, like this. Then they're not going to be creative. It's not going to encourage any creativity. So pillar one is that kids need to have a positive environment and feel good about themselves to be able to be creative. So the first step for any teacher is to create that environment that the kids can feel like they want to be creative. Like this little boy. I like this boy. He's pretty cool. Number two, to encourage creativity and develop creativity, you need to be creative yourself. Now, if you come to class and just do the same thing every day, you don't model creativity, you don't do anything new or you don't change how you do things or try new ideas, then why would your students do it, right? They, they need to see a really good model of creativity. So number two is you be creative. Number three, children need choice, and this will come up, at, um, I'll talk about this further, but at any time they have choice, they have to use some sort of cognitive process and think creatively about which one do they want. Do you want to play this game or this game? Do you want to write it or say it? Do you want to draw it or do you want to do a presentation? Anytime you have a chance for choice in the classroom, you're building creativity. I'll show you some more later. Number four is about how to use questions effectively, that it's not just what is this, it's red, you know, what is this? It's a dog. Um, I'll talk about that in one slide later. And how do we make connections between, so making connections is how do kids make connections between the language they're learning and the rest of the world? So as simple as that activity we did before, are you a rock or a feather? You're making a connection between yourself and this uh, object, right, the rock. What is a rock? Is it hard? Is it soft? What are the things that I need to make? I'm trying to connect to that. And by making those connections, you're developing this creativity of ideas, right? So it's, at the moment, there's a lot of kids um, stuck at home due to the school closures. What's great is that when we're teaching online, the kids are actually making connections to what's at home. So if we're talking about you know, something soft, then they might go and grab all their toys and show the teacher. So then they're starting to have a connection between the classroom, the language, and real life and different ideas. And the, I'll, we'll have a little bit, have a look later at this one, but exploring ideas is the idea of that once you've got one idea, how far can you take that idea through things like mind maps? And I will show you a cool activity. And lucky last, is getting the kids to think about their own creativity. So once they've been creative, you say, well, why was that creative? Did you enjoy doing that activity? Did you like that or you didn't like it? And then they start to realize that they might enjoy the process of becoming creative. So those are the seven pillars. Uh, I'll send this out to you and you can you can review these. And I've got a really nice article to share with you, but these are these are called the seven pillars of creativity. Um, just one more point on my friend Ken Robinson before we go and play some games and activities. Um, Ken has Ken Robinson said so much on creativity. My, I, I think that really my favourite quotes here. I've put my favourite quotes here, but just a few to point out to you are: um, imagination is the source of everything in, in human achievement. Uh, we don't grow out of it. We don't grow out of creativity. We, 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 we don't, sorry, we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of creativity. That we, we, we are very creative when we're young and then we go to school and we go to work and we get less and less creative. Um, and sometimes we're educated out of it. I think my favorite quote from Ken Robinson is this though, that imagination is the source of all human achievement. That, so if we, if we don't have this imagination, how do new ideas come up? So, Ken Robinson talks about how schools kill creativity. And um, I'm going to show you four answers from uh, two gentlemen called Nick Peachy and Alan Maley. What do you guys think? What, 
why did why is sometimes creativity killed at school that we don't encourage it what type of things happen in schools that stop creativity can you think of anything that would stop creativity any idea is fine yeah grammar focusing on just grammar rules then we don't have anything to do with creativity good point um is it Nayera? Nayera. That's a really good one. So what is killing? Yeah, <laughs> comprehension. If you're just doing comprehension, oh, what's GTM? Oh, I must be, I, I need to learn something new here. Bananas, GTM, get, imagination is more important than knowledge. Yeah, I love that one, Paul. I, I really want to know what GTM is, Bananas. Um, comprehension questions don't encourage any creativity. They just say, read this and answer the question. There's no real room for thought there, is there? Yes, Naria, focusing on tests and grades. Oh, GTM, GTM, grammar translation, yeah. Grammar translation does nothing really for learning. It doesn't prove that you can speak English. It might be useful in a university, I'm not sure. Thank you, yeah, GTM, right, grammar translation. Totally agree. Tests and great, I mean, focusing on exams, and I'm based in China here, everything is focused on exams. There is no encouragement of creativity, really. And that's why when, when kids leave school, then they go into the workplace, they get shocked at how, how it is. Yeah, I totally agree, Benaz. Where, where, uh, Benaz, are you in Iran as well? And I'm really interested that in Iran, that is the same. Yes, the course books. So um, I'm, uh, my background is also from publishing as well and a few people in this session today. And I think that publishers are one of the biggest issues when it comes to stifling creativity. So let me just show you four answers. These answers come from a, a very interesting paper uh, written by, put together by the British Council and it was put together by Nick Peachy and Alan Maley and it's, um, I'll send that out as well as a PDF. But in this, in this um, paper, they talk about four things that kill creativity. It's class size. So that's a huge one in China. We have, we have classes that are, have 50 kids. There's no time for you to be an individual and think for yourself. You just follow, copy, and go. So class size is one. Um, textbooks, you're right. Course books, too especially when it's one size fits all, right? If it's just, this is the course book and we have to finish the course book and teachers don't know, necessarily have the skills to, to not be able to finish the, you know, do anything else. So we're just focusing on one thing. And sadly, there are textbooks in schools now that were written in the 80s and keep getting published and rolled out again. There are some excellent textbooks out there, but unfortunately there's some very old style ones just have a fixed rule and follow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very similar here in Asia as well. I'm sure people like Paul have had the same experience in Bangkok as well. Exam-based curriculums obviously don't do anything great for creativity because you're just focusing on remembering and going to do it, and especially when the tests aren't really asking anything to be creative. And this is the, this is the fourth one I hadn't thought about before, and it's a very interesting point. If you're just focusing on skills for employment, sometimes you miss the skills for life. So there's, a, there's an idea that we're just trying to get people ready to go to do jobs as opposed to ready to live as humans. And language doesn't, you don't just learn English to go and learn, uh, do a job, you learn English to go and speak to the world, you know, come to webinars <laughs> across the, you know, in different countries and share ideas. So. When you're only focusing on employment, you're not really encouraging them to be super creative, which goes against what the job forum thing said, but it's just an interesting point. So all of those ideas, that was a lot of ideas and theories. I mean, I'm just going to share some of my favorite activities. Um, the point is that with the activities I'm going to show you, each one of them includes some of those pillars some of those ideas that we've been talking about here. So today my idea is not just to give you activities, it's to give you the thinking about the activities. So this is what, the first one I love, and I use this in many webinars. It's called a choice. This is about choice, right? So every time you offer choice to a student, they have to think 
and be creative about what's the best way to do it, what's, what do I want or I don't want. So this is called a choice menu. So maybe at the end of an activity, you can say to the students, okay, we can either draw it or act it out, or we're going to say, or we're going to do a test, <laughs> or you're going to work alone or do it as a whole class. But by giving them the choice, they can be more creative about how they want to come up with the final outcome of their work, right? And it works well with kids. Some kids might want to do a test, that's okay, but maybe they only want to draw it. So at the end of each lesson, you can cross off which one they've done, and, and then eventually they've done all the types, and they've, at least they've had that chance to choose how they want to do it. Another really cool one is called the reward choice menu. So at the you, you tell your class, you know, if you're very well behaved today or if you finish all your work, you can choose a reward. And what's nice is you get the kids to write down the rewards so they become really creative about what they want to get. So here's one from a class where it's um, they can choose where they're going to sit for the day. They can have lunch with a teacher. I'm not sure all teachers want to do that, but um, they can do show and tell. They can have extra time in the computer lab, for example. Um, they can go and read to another class. They can have lunch with another staff member. I mean, there's so many things here, choosing where they can stand in the line. But by giving them that choice, you're letting them be creative about what's the outcome of my good behavior. Uh, letting them choose their friends, of course, in, in friendship grouping doesn't always work. How they're going to manifest their outcomes, like is it a video, a presentation, um, how many sentences they're going to do. I mean, sometimes it's nice just to say to them, you know, I, how many sentences can you achieve in this activity? Do you want to do five or ten? All of this helps develop learner autonomy as well. So I really love these. These are called choice menus. Adding choice to any part of the classroom will add creativity because every time you make a choice, you, think, you have to think about it, which is good, which is bad, advantage, disadvantage. Um, oh, this is a really lovely story. I, I, I really like sharing this story with you guys. Um, sometimes you don't have to tell the kids how to play a certain activity. So I'm going to give you one example. Uh, my Our company, StudyCat, works with a charity in Cambodia and we provide language learning apps and language learning classroom material for the schools in Cam for a school in Cambodia that's quite very poor. Um, and, some, and I was there recently and I was playing this game. Yep. So we all know this game, right? You have to turn over the cards. And this is on the, either on the whiteboard, um, projected onto the whiteboard. So we played the game as a whole class and you have to turn over the cards. So orange, orange, yellow, yellow. And when they match together, they, they get to keep the cards. But this is on the board. And then afterwards, um, we have donated some tablets to them, some tablets, uh, you know, iPads. And I handed out the iPads and I said, okay, in a group of five, we're going to play the same game. So you can see the same game here. It's the matching game, right? It's the same game. And here it is here, the same game. What was most interesting was that each group played the game in a different way. So in this group, they all just played together. In this group, they played three versus three, right? So they had two teams. And in this group, they went number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. My point is that I didn't tell them what to do. I let them choose how they're going to play. And then they were creative in how they came up with what they're going to do. And because they were creative, they wanted to play for longer. So they still had the same outcome. They were learning the colors and learning how to say them and putting them into sentences. But what I gave them was the power to be able to do it in a creative way. And by giving them the creativity, they were more interested to keep doing it. So it's just a really nice way that you can integrate a tablet into the, into the school. You can also help kids in groups come up with their own ways of doing things. This is another awesome one. I've been using these for years. Um, you make dices. You've all seen a dice before, right? So here is a cutout. I'll, I'll share it with you. I like to make really big ones, really can you see me? Big ones, right? And then you make a dice and then you just 
for anything. When you're telling a story, you could do it at the beginning of class or at the end. We're talking about, um, you know, a monkey, and we roll the dice, and then it's like, uh, where is the monkey? Okay. Or who is the monkey friends with? When? In, um, how did he get there? When did we see the monkey? What is he doing? But by having the dice, the kids have to come up with creative questions about the topic that you're talking about. And you never know what the, what the question is going to be. So it's really a lovely way to keep practicing question forms, but also encouraging them to be creative with their questions. Um, has anyone seen this before? Who can tell me what this is? If anyone can tell me who came up with this first, they get they get uh, ten points. Oh, four people. Who's going to be first? Yes, Alex was the winner. So when you have a look at, um, yeah, good job. Yeah, you can still type it. Yeah, so we, who knows what, um, who knows what lots and hots are. This will give you a hundred points. Oh, Amanda Jones going to be the winner. I'm interested, yep, and higher order, right? So what's interesting about question forms is, um, I, and I really believe in this, is that most of our students are down here, right? Lower order thinking skills, things like what colour is it, um, you know, just recognising facts. Is it big? Is it small? Things like this, right? So a lot of our students' language ability is quite far down on Bloom's taxonomy. It's quite down here. I, I don't. I, I can do a whole session on just questioning, but just a quick point on it is: our students sometimes don't have the English ability to have the higher order thinking skills. So the simplest solution is always allow a little bit of L1. What is L1? People, L1 is yes mazui ma, mazu, mazui mazayu but not yeah first language i always encourage some first language in the classroom to encourage the higher order thinking skills tell me so maybe you're you're teaching them okay let's let's talk about this in english but let's really think about it in my first language so we can have a relationship about thinking about that and that's where we're really encouraging your creativity so just keep this in mind Sometimes students don't have the English ability to to express their creativity, so let them do it in their L1. Um, a few a few more activities before we wrap up. Problem solving is one of the keys to language learning. So what can we do with blocks? This is one of my favourite activities. Um, this is very very simple. So you've all seen blocks, right? You all have Lego or or, or a copy of Lego. A really nice one is you build a little model, so something like this, and you put it outside the classroom. You put it outside the classroom. And half the kids are outside the classroom and half the kids are inside the classroom. And you put the little model somewhere and the other kids just have the blocks. And they have to, the first group of kids have to look at the blocks and they have to run back in and tell them how to build it. Now you don't tell them how to do it, you just say, the kids in the classroom have to build what's out of the classroom, but they can't see it. And the kids outside the classroom can help them, but they're not allowed to touch the blocks. So they have to be super creative in how to get them to build the blocks, right? So they'll say, okay, two yellow blocks on the bottom, you know, and then red, and they might do it as a relay. They might try to draw it and bring it in, or there's lots of different ways that they can solve the problem of how are they going to get the kids in the classroom to build the blocks that look like the blocks outside the classroom. And it really encourages creativity. It's one of my favorite activities. It's very similar to what we call running dictation, but it's kind of, it's a lot more uh, creative than just running dictation. Uh, I was going to show you this activity, but uh, I can't. So I'm going to skip this one, unfortunately. Um, does anyone know what this is? Can anyone see this? Do you know what this is? Anyone know what this is? Go, Mazayu. I never played this. Yeah, Minecraft. Oh, you even know it's Minecraft 5. I don't know that. 
Um, Minecraft is one of the most beautiful places for kids to be creative. They have to build, they have to work together. Um, I'm not sure how much you can encourage it, but it's just another really lovely one to add to language teaching. You add a little bit of Minecraft, tell them to do it after school, as if they're using English, but they're also developing creativity. Okay, Here's, have a look at this picture. If anyone can tell me, oh, it's a bit slow. If anyone can tell me, what does what is the English phrase this picture represents? What is the English phrase this picture represents? Can anyone? You guys are so good today. I'm highly. Uh -uh. What is the English phrase? It's a. It's a. It's a. You have to be very clever to get this one. Uh, maybe not got stuck. So the first word is throw. <laughs> All right, I'm going to just put it in here. Throw a. Have you ever heard this one before? Yeah, throw a spanner in the works. So try to picture this picture. If I throw a spanner in these gears, this is a spanner. Oh, sorry. This is a spanner here. Oh, Josh. Sorry, guys. I'm just on the. Uh huh. If I throw a spanner, this is a spanner, in these gears, it's going to break the gears, right? Sometimes when you're in class, one of the best ways to encourage creativity is throw a spanner in the work. So, for example, I used to go to, I would go to class and change all the seating. So the kids walk in and all the seats are in different places. So they have to think, oh my God, where am I going to sit? I might say, okay, well, I've taken all the books out of class today. So what are we going to do? We have no books. We're going to have to create our own books. Um, in the middle of a game, change the rules because that's how life works, right? So by changing something very quickly that they're used to, changing a routine. Now, we know young kids like routine, but sometimes just changing the routine, yeah, organized chaos, exactly, Paul. It just it, it forces them to have to rethink how we're going to do this today. You know, the teacher always makes us line up at the end of class. Well, today we're not doing it that way. We're going to do it a different way, so they've got to think differently. So it's called throwing a spanner in the works. Okay, back to you guys. This is an old, old English game, but, you know, three truths and a lie. If you get your kids to come up, I have three things, four things written on this. It should be two truths and a lie, but... Which one do you think is a lie? So number one, is it number one, I've been to 42 countries, 32 countries. Number two, I used to live in Papua New Guinea. Number three, my favorite food is tofu. Or number four, I've never had a driving license. Which one is a lie? Yeah, call my bluff, exactly. It's such a great one for creativity, um, Nayera, because, ah, who said two, 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 four? No, not four. Okay, I'll tell you very quickly. The, the reason I love this one, yeah, okay, so one person got it. <laughs> so, yes, I have been to more than 32 countries. Um, but, and I did, I, I spent five years as a kid growing up in Papua New Guinea. Um, I love tofu, but it's not my favorite food. My favorite food is chocolate cake and stuff. And actually, I've never had a driving license because I just never had one. So, but my point is you can playing this game is a highly creative game, right? Kids have to think about it. What, how can I come up with a lie? Lying is one of the great creative skills. My daughter can attest to that. Okay, a few more to go and then we'll be done. This one's a great one. This one's just called what can you see? What can you smell? What can you hear? Now, most of the time when you're doing reading activities, we just say, what can you see? I can see something. But let's be creative and think about what can we smell and what can we hear. So let's look at this picture. Uh huh. This picture, is it up? <laughs> it's so slow on coming up, isn't it? There we go. Um, in this picture, we can see lots of children, but that's not very interesting. I can see trees. But what can you smell? What can you smell? Tell me, what can you smell? anything yeah what else can you smell besides the grass something different yeah cool right 
So now you're getting your kids to be, I love doing this one. Ask them, show a picture and just say, what can you smell? And then they've got to really think like, oh, and they're making that connection between what does it smell like? And they've got to think back and pull memory. Yes, yeah, sweet. Yes, yeah, sweat. Sweat's a great one. Who said sweat? Yeah, very good, Sarah Young. Um, and the other one is what can you hear? What can you hear? I'm listening. And I always say to my kids, what can you hear? And when, we're out, when we're reading books, we're really listening to what we can hear as well. Yeah, laughter, right? And then all these new words start coming out. They might ask you, how do you say this word? Ah, oh, birds. I didn't even think about birds. Can you hear the wind? Children laughing? Maybe there's some children fighting. Who knows? I can hear whispering down here. They're, all the kids are whispering, right? So really, yeah, the sound of cars. Maybe there's some cars driving past, right? So now you get that idea that, the kids just yeah, motorbikes if you're in Vietnam, and, and it's very cultural. Different countries will have different sounds, right? But then the kids are being creative, thinking what is around this environment, not just what does it, you know, this is red, this is blue, this is a circle. That, that's only half of where language exists. That's another really cool one. So that one's called What Can You See, Smell, and Hear. If you think about the pillars, um, the seven pillars, this is what Carol Reeve was, is calling exploring ideas, right? You're exploring further beyond just it's a park. You know, you could say it's a park or you can say let's smell the park, let's hear the park, let's see the park. It's much more than just saying it's a park. Then we come to, yeah, I mean, mind mapping is a very classic one. I don't think that's come up on your screen yet. Yeah, so every time we, I, you know, we do a park or we do anything, we, get the, we can get kids to make mind maps and collaborate together. Another very simple one. But that's, again, one of the pillars, exploring ideas and making connections. Does anyone know who this is? There are no Australians in here today. It's a little bit slow coming up, I've noticed. Um, if you can guess who this is, I promise I will send you... Oh, if, does Paul Granger know who this is? <laughs> Pencil Boy, no. This is a very famous character from when I was young called Mr. Squiggle. Mr. Squiggle. Mr. Squiggle has a pencil on his nose and he has the coolest activities you can do for creativity. Um, so a really simple one you can do in class is you just draw these simple things on the board and you tell the kids, you need to create your own picture out of these pictures, right? So you just draw some simple things on the board and then you say, create a picture. So here's one I did earlier. These were the pictures and this is the what the students drew. It's very slow, sorry. So you can see here they drew a tree and they drew a, the circle. So the, the square became a tree house. This became a cloud in the sun. The squiggly line became a caterpillar. The circle became a flower. And again, it's making connections with the outside world and encouraging creativity. Then you get the kids to get together and make a story out of it. They can talk about something. Such a simple activity. It takes about you know, 20 seconds to do. Draw it on the board. Get them to draw. Be, and then come up with some creative ideas. Uh, this is one of my, we'll do one, two more activities before we finish. The, one of the simplest games to play is just called word scramble. So I've got some words here on the board. And then you just ask who can come up with the longest sentence. So you throw up all the words on the board that you use that day in class. And then you don't need to include the function words. You don't need to include the tenses. You just, you, that will be something they have to create on their own. So I'll give you. 10, 20 seconds, who can come up with the longest logical sentence? You can change the tense and you can add function words. There might be a prize. I'm going to do one myself. The monkeys. You guys go. I'm, I'm really interested to see who can come up with the funniest one or the longest one. Jumped and danced on the elephant <laughs> who was eating jelly, red jelly. That's my one. 
on here yours I'm going to let you type I'm everyone is typing I'm very, I'm very proud of Iran today Elephants dance on tables while eating red jelly and monkeys swinging side by side on the trees having apples. Yeah, exactly, right? So you get kids to get together. I like to do it in groups of three and you say, okay, now I want you to write the longest sentence you can from today. And then what they do is they start adding in, you know, maybe the past tense or they're adding in the present continuous, but that's okay. Let them be creative with how they're going to do it. And then they share the ideas around. Um, they share the ideas around and then they have to correct each other doing that, okay? Um, uh, the next one is really quickly, so really simple other ideas just to show you before I wrap up is putting all the different animals on the board. They have to make the same sentences. Um, sorry, guys, just the, my cat is making a lot of noise. Um, this is a really nice one. Silhouettes are a really excellent one you can use where you have, you put up a silhouette like this and you just say, just ask simple questions. What color is her dress? What is she doing? What does she look like? And then they have to be really creative thinking about the way that they're going to describe what this, what this person looks like. It, they could all have different answers. Again, does anyone know what story this comes from? Yeah, Alice in Wonderland, right? So I love using these types of silhouettes. You can just always just type it in. Silhouettes, right? Oh, I love the, your ones. The monkeys were eating elephants with apples while they were dancing and jumping on tables. Um, but with the silhouettes, it just gives the kids some way to, they have to sort of think about what is this? It's a rabbit. What's he wearing? What does it look like? What's the relationship between them? Yeah, no worries. Sorry about the poor connection. Um, just two more to wrap up, okay, because I've been going through so many. I didn't realize how many I had here. This is the last one we'll do today. How many different ways can you use these two cups? How many ways can we use these cups? Just anything, and then I'll give you my list. And I, I need, uh, I want to, um, highlight yeah unlimited right I, I just want to show you quickly because i know that there's thousands of answers right the point is coming into class with just something as simple as a plus a paper cup and then asking them come up with as many ways to use this as possible yeah no worries sorry alex it's running a little bit later i'm not usually this long so for example just i mean having two cups could just be for drinking a hat an ear protector string phone tracing circles etc so guys, I'm just going to wrap up. I'm not going to go through these. I'm going to send them to you. Little other ideas that you can have are things like when you do roll call, rather than saying present or here, they have to say an animal, for example. So Alex, elephant, um, John, chicken, you know, they rather than having to just do the same thing every day, change the way you do your roll call. Uh, another excellent one is tickets out the door. But um, guys, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to, I'll send you these and share them all with you. When you're doing lining up, don't just say line up. Line up from tallest to shortest. Anything to change the way you do things. Just a few. Um, always integrate creativity into all of your activities in class. Like they said, with the seven pillars, make it part of the class. You, If you use your imagination and come up with new ideas, the kids will come up with new ideas. Think about the little C for creativity. It's part of, it's things that they do every day, every single action. It's not just doing a painting or doing a drawing or having a dance. It's every little tiny thing that they do is part of giving them a chance to develop creativity. Be a model for creativity. So you, you have to have your own imagination, but also show cool and fun and creative ideas. And lastly, and most importantly, Encouraging mistakes is one of the best ways to develop creativity because I, I will send it to you um, because if you're not prepared to be wrong, as Ken Robinson said, he can have the last word today. You'll never come up with anything original. 
So guys, just remember, that's everything. I know that was a lot and I usually don't spend an hour. It's usually 45 minutes, but there was so much content today. Remember, check out um, studycat.com. Uh, you can uh, check out our classroom uh, content there and download some free trials of that. You can join the Study Cat Club, which gives you access. It's so slow, this connection today. It's very, um, yeah, the Study Cat Club will let you download everything. You can download all. I will email this content to you, but you can go back, and if you join the Study Cat Club, you can download all the last webinars, watch them all. There's so much content in there for you to share. Um, inside the Study Cat Club, there's also all these worksheets, activities, uh, blog articles, etc. And remember, next week's webinar is on flipping classrooms. So it's about how do you get kids to learn more out of the classroom so they can be better in the classroom. Um, and it's going to be really focused around uh, a, a language learning app that helps you do that. So please, please, please sign up for the next one. It's going to be a big one. We're getting a lot of people from around the world. Um, and check us out on studycat.com slash schools. So I'll see you all next week. I will email you all this content. Tell all your friends. Share everything. And thank you very much. You're all amazing. And be creative. There was just too much content today, guys. So I apologize. So I'll share it with you so you can have a better look at it, okay? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Fazena. Thank you, Tamara. Always good to see you. Thank you, Naima. Thank you, Elise. Oh, I didn't see you today, Alicia. Thank you, Masood. I'm so happy that we're building a, a following in uh, Iran. And Najas, if you're still there, bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Fazena. Fazana. 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 Oh. I hope I'm getting it right. Thank you, Sarah Young. All right. Um, check your emails later tonight, and I hope to see you next week. Peace.